shout of hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord is worthy to be praised. He is a great and a mighty God. Amen and amen. You may be seated, everyone, as we look to the word of God together for one more Sunday, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 11. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, The Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. This morning we're looking at a 3,000 year old promise that comes to us from the pages of the Old Testament. A promise of restoration for God's people who will return to him with all of their hearts. This passage of scripture and this promise from God is a promise to those who may have wandered away from God. Maybe if they have wandered even far away from God, if they will turn around and turn their attention toward God and begin to move toward God, God lays out a path for them to experience the restoration and the blessing of God all over again. Everybody say, God is not finished with me yet. Yeah, and I know that many of you in the house today have not wandered away from God. You are walking with God. You love God. You are faithful to God. And yet there are those around us perhaps who once knew the Lord, once walked with the Lord, once served and worshiped the Lord, who have strayed away from their relationship with him who maybe have launched out into a life of sin all over again, even after having experienced God's forgiveness and grace. And they are far out, we might say, in a distant country away from God. But God, who is such a gracious and loving and merciful God, throws out a lifeline to anybody and everybody who has strayed and wandered away from him and God sends out an invitation to say, come on home and live in my favor and my blessing again. How many of you know again this morning that God is a good and a merciful God? Say amen. Amen. Well, we've examined this promise in stages over the last several Sundays. We began by by examining for a while what it means to be God's people. Because God begins this promise by saying, if my people who are called by my name, and we recognize that as God's people, God has placed upon us his claim and his name. We are called by the name of the Lord. And when we recognize we are God's people, even if we find ourselves way out there somewhere, we recognize there's a home to come home to. Could you say amen? Amen. Secondly, we examine what it means to be willing to turn to God and to humble ourselves before God so that our hearts within us can be stirred and so that when God speaks to us or when God draws us or when God pokes us or when God prods us, we are willing to sense that moving of God and to move at the the direction of God, a willingness to humble ourselves. 
and to come to the conclusion, I need God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Last Sunday, we looked at the third message about prayer and seeking God's face. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And we said last Sunday morning that God has offered us the invitation to pray and to get back into communication with God. Last Sunday morning, we urged everybody who's fallen into a life of prayerlessness to open the lines of communication once again because God wants to hear from his people. This morning, we come to the final piece of this promise, the final condition. God says in the promise, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then God says, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Now listen up to me close this morning, everybody. I want you to see that this is a promise from God, not only a promise of forgiveness, but a promise of restoration, okay? Because sometimes people think, well, I have, I have failed God, I have strayed away from God, maybe I can get back to God, sort of like the prodigal son said when he found himself in the pig pen, he said, he said I guess I'll go back home and say to my father, Father, I'm not worthy to be your son, so make me like one of your hired servants. That prodigal son thought, if I come home, my father might welcome me home and forgive me, but things will never be the same again. I won't be a son anymore. From now on, I'll be a lowly servant. But God's promise is this. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. This is a promise of forgiveness and restoration. Could you say amen? amen? It's a promise of the grace of God that says I want you back in my family and I want you back in my favor. I've been encouraging you over these last several weeks never to give up on any backslider because if God is throwing out the lifeline, we need to be praying and believing that our lost loved ones, our straying loved ones will take hold of the lifeline and come back home to the Lord. Would you say amen? If God has hope for people to be restored, then we should too. Could you say amen? amen? So this morning we hear the last piece of that puzzle. If my people will turn from their wicked ways and turn back to me. This morning I want to take a journey and a look at what it means to turn from wicked ways for someone who has once walked with God. We want to review those wicked ways. We want to recognize the results of those wicked ways. And we want to talk about repenting from those wicked ways. First, let's review those wicked ways that God is referring to when he says, if my people will turn from their wicked ways. Now remember, this promise is particularly about those who have walked with God but have now turned back away from God to live a wicked life, a sinful life, a wayward life, a godless life. If my people will turn from their wicked ways, what do those wicked ways look like? Well, in the Old Testament, it certainly involved insolent idolatry, a sense of serving other gods and turning away from the true God. Remember that God gave in the Ten Commandments this urgent command in Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Look up at me, everybody. Nobody and nothing can come before God. He is first. He is Lord. He is ruler. 
And God says, I don't want any competition. There can be nobody and nothing that comes before me and my relationship with you. And any other focus in our lives that pulls us away from God is idolatry. For the Old Testament believers, in the pages of the Old Testament, that idolatry involved actual idols. Idols made of wood and stone and gold and silver that a person might turn to and bow down before that physical idol and worship that idol instead of the true and the living God. When we come to the pages of the New Testament, we find that believers were coming to Christ in the New Testament world from that very thing, from a life of worshiping idols. Now, here we are today in America. We can hardly make this a practical thing for us if we think about it only in the sense of physical idols sitting up on a block for us to bow down and worship. There is that taking place around the world today. But we don't really know that so much here in America. But let me remind you that when we put anything or anybody else before God, that constitutes a sense of idolatry. In fact, the New Testament does that. Colossians chapter 3 says if anybody is greedy, just be sure of this, Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, greed is idolatry. It's putting money before God. That's why Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money, said Jesus. And so when we think about idolatry today, it's putting the desires for anything else before God. And idolatry is insulting to God. God is a jealous God. He wants to be the first focus of our lives, and he wants to be the love of our lives. Could you say amen? Amen. That's why Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love God more than anything or anybody else. And so when we put anything else before God, that idolatry comes in. Those wicked ways that God's people sometimes turn to involve the worship of other things. Maybe other so-called gods or maybe other certain so-called interests in life. Idolatry. Those wicked ways also involve intentional insubordination, disobedience, to God's commands. We hear Jesus asking in Luke chapter six, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? In other words, Jesus says, if you're going to call me your Lord, then it's going to be incumbent upon you to follow me as your Lord, to listen to me, to obey me, to do what I say. Jesus was speaking to many people who were calling him Lord, but they were living sinful lives. Jesus would say, turn from that sin, but they said, no, Lord, we want to continue doing what we want to do. You know, many people today call Jesus Lord, but they do not do what he says. They live in clear, defiant, ongoing disobedience to God while calling Jesus Lord. And Jesus simply said, don't waste your breath. Are you here this morning? Jesus says, don't waste your breath. Don't call me Lord, Lord, if you're not going to do the things that I say. And so there is intentional insubordination, disobedience to God in the area of sins that leads people into wicked ways. Now let's pause for a moment to think about the categories of sin in the New Testament that that clearly separate people from God. And these are categories of sin. The New Testament applies even to those maybe who've known the Lord but have turned away from the Lord to live in those sinful lifestyles. These are separating sins. 
There are three specific passages in the New Testament that refer to sins that have the power to separate us from God and from heaven. Are you awake today? Here they are. Here are those categories of sin that can separate you from God and from heaven. And the New Testament reveals that even somebody who has been forgiven and knows the Lord, if they turn back to that lifestyle and determine to continue living in that, those sins can and will separate them from God and from heaven. I'm thinking about three passages here. I'm thinking about Galatians chapter 5. I'm thinking about 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm thinking about Revelation chapter 22. These categories of sins are as follows. Sexual immorality. Idolatry. Thieves. The greedy. And swindlers. Slanderers. Do you know lying about people to run them down is a serious sin before God? Slander, drunkards, murderers, liars, hatred, and witchcraft. Let me read those again because these are sins that separate people from God. And these are also sins that are often indulged in and engaged in in an ongoing defiant uh, manner. In other words, you've decided to live in that path. It's not a fall. It's not a mistake. It's not a temptation that hits you and then you prayed for forgiveness. It's an ongoing decision to live in that lifestyle. These things separate people from God. Can you hear them again? Sexual immorality, idolatry, thievery and greed and swindling, slander, Drunkards, drunken, drunkenness, murder, lying, hatred, and witchcraft. Now let me say this today. All of these sins may be forgiven, but they must also be forsaken. Are you here? Yesterday in my Bible reading, I was reminded of Paul's words to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Preach the word. Be prepared in, an instant in season and out of season because the time will come when people will not want to put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will turn away to teachers who will say what their itching ears want to hear. They won't want to hear the truth, but I'm confident that the congregation here at First Assembly would rather hear the truth of the word of God. I'm confident of that. So I say to you this morning, these sinful lifestyles will separate people from their relationship with God and from heaven says the closing words of the book of Revelation. And so intentional insubordination and a life of ongoing willful sin separates people from God. That's why in this promise that is before us today in the Old Testament, God says, if my people want to come back to me and experience my healing and my restoration, they must turn from their wicked ways. And turn back to me, says the Lord. Idolatry, insubordination. Thirdly, when we think about God's people living in sin, we think about the increasing indifference that comes when someone who has known the Lord continues to live in defiance to the Lord. Listen to Revelation chapter 2, verse 21, to a woman who called herself a prophetess. In the church at Thyatira, Jesus says this, I have given that woman time to repent of her immorality, but she is what? She is unwilling. I have told her. Je this is Jesus saying to this woman in the church who's teaching people in the church that it's okay to live in sexual immorality. Jesus says, I have told that woman to repent of this, but she is unwilling. And Jesus says, I've given her time to do it, but even after time has passed, she continues to hold her ground 
and defy me. Think about that. Are you here this morning? Think about it. Jesus says, that woman, I have, I have urged her again and again, but she continues to stand her ground in defiance against me, says Jesus. If we had time to continue looking at that letter, which we have on occasion here in this sanctuary, we would find that Jesus says judgment is coming because of that. Those wicked ways, idolatry, insubordination, indifference. The truth is when someone has known the Lord, continues to live in defiance to the the Lord, their hearts become harder and harder and harder and harder. They harden themselves against the Lord. Listen, it becomes easier and easier and easier to say to the Lord, I've heard you, Lord, but no, I'm going to do my own thing. And the heart becomes increasingly hardened against God, increasing indifference. And the word of God warns us for somebody in that condition of an impending implosion. Listen to this word. This is a very important word from Proverbs 29 verse one, that everybody who's living in defiance to the word of God needs to hear. Listen to Proverbs 29 one. A man who remains stiff-necked after many rebukes, will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Now, that's a frightening word. But the word is this. If you continue to live in your defiance against God, there will come a time when the grace space will run out and you will face destruction. And the scripture says sometimes that destruction comes suddenly and sometimes that destruction comes with no remedy. Hmm. So listen, for anybody who has known the Lord, the choice to go back out and live in sin is a very perilous choice to make. Are you here? It's a very perilous choice to make. Let's take a moment to recognize the results of continued sin, willful sin. Let's recognize the results of those wicked ways. Is everybody still awake today? Say amen. Amen. Does everybody have the stomach for this message? Say amen. amen. Let's think about the results of those wicked ways. These are seven biblical consequences of continued willful sin. Now again, We're not talking about somebody who falls into a sin and then repents and asks the Lord to forgive them. How many of you have ever sinned and asked since you've been a Christian and you asked the Lord to forgive you and you went on? Yes. The the scripture tells us plainly in 1 John chapter 1, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. one, And that's 1 John chapter 2. Chapter 2, 1 John chapter 1 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So if you sin, ask God for forgiveness and get up and determine not to make the same mistake again. Could I have an amen? Amen. We're talking today about running on into willful, unrepentant sin. Look at what we find in the scriptures. Seven biblical consequences of continued willful sin. First is blindness and bondage. Remember Samson's haircut. Samson was a man who was anointed with the power of God. In fact, God gave him supernatural strength for the purpose of bringing victory to Israel's armies. And Samson was an Old Testament superman. He had supernatural strength given to him by God. But Samson played around with the devil. Over and over again, Samson was unfaithful to his vows to God. He determined that he was going to live in sexual immorality. That was ultimately Samson's downfall. And as he lived in that immorality, he flirted around with the devil again and again and again. One night, he gave away the secret to his strength, to a wicked woman, and she betrayed him. 
The next morning, they cut off all of Samson's hair, and his supernatural strength disappeared from him in a moment. God had warned him of this again and again, but he chose to continue in his sin. He lost his strength, and the enemies, the Philistines, captured him. Listen to what Judges 16.21 says. The Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grinding in the prison. Samson's life was destroyed because of his continual willful sin, blindness and bondage. A second consequence to continued willful sin is division and dysfunction. Division and dysfunction. Remember David's adultery. King David was a man after God's own heart. He knew God, but he chose to flirt around one night and uh, to engage again in sexual immorality with a woman who was married to another man. He brought her to the palace. He engaged in sexual immorality with her. He sent her home. She became pregnant. David tried to hide it. He couldn't hide it, and so he had to commit murder. He murdered. He had the woman's husband murdered by his army in order to hide his adultery. Listen, David, a man after God's heart, did this. He took a step into sin. He stepped further. He, stepped, he moved so far as to engage in the sin of murder to hide his crime of adultery. It, that was a journey for David. That was not one night of sin for David. That was a spiritual journey for David where he plunged his life into disobedience and sin. And as a result of that, he faced the the judgment of God. God forgave David, but listen to what 2 Samuel 12 says. This is what the Lord says to you, David. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. And do you know from that day forward, we can track it through the Old Testament history, from that day forward, David's family was a disaster. His own son would rebel against him and try to take the kingdom. A dis- his, his future would be, and his family would fall into great division and dysfunction and disaster because of his willful sin. Think about this, a third biblical consequence of continued willful sin is this, vulnerability and viability. In other words, you leave yourself unprotected when you continue in willful sin. Are you here? Remember Achan's thievery. Achan was a man in the army of Israel when they crossed the Jordan River and went into the promised land. And the first battle they would face in the promised land was the battle of Jericho. God said to the whole army, destroy everything. Don't keep anything. This city is to be destroyed, all the stuff. But one man named Achan decided that he would steal a couple things from that city and hide them under his tent. Think about that. He stole some gold and he stole a Babylonish Babylonish garment, a, a, a uniform. Gold and a uniform. And he hid them under his tent. And he thought nobody would find out, but how many of you know that God knows everything? And God revealed. So the army marched out for its second battle They thought this battle will be easy to win. They're going against a little town called Ai, but when they march against Ai, the few souls from Ai come out from the city and whip the Israelites down and kill a number of their men and send them home defeated. Think about this now. The great army of Israel defeated by a little town, by a little little group of townspeople. Why? Why? Because God's blessing had been lifted. 
God's protection had been lifted off of them. And Joshua complained to the Lord. Well, Lord, what's this all about, Lord? And here's how the Lord responded to Joshua, the leader. Look at it in Joshua 7. Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. Now, this is one man who did all this. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. Now, get this, verse 12. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. Look at me, everybody. When you run out into sin, you put yourself at great risk. When you walk out from under God's grace and God's protection, you put yourself at great risk. Here it is in the pages of scripture. God withdrew his protection from his army because sin was in the camp. So willful defiant sin leads to vulnerability and viability. How many of you here want the Lord to be on your side in life? How many of you want to win the struggles and the battles you face in life? Say amen. Then 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 you've got to live for the Lord. Willful, defiant sin removes that covering here. Look at it. I know I'm taking time on this, but these are important biblical principles. Think about this fourth consequence of continued willful sin for the people of God. Shortage and suffering. And this comes from the scripture we're dealing with in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, says the Lord. The Lord himself says, if my people run out into willful, defiant sin and keep going in that direction, I'm going to have to bring judgment upon them. Listen, God's judgment is intended to bring people back into relationship with him if we will allow it to do that. But God says, I will withhold the rain I'll withhold the blessing of rain. I will command locusts to go and devour the land. God says, I may even send a plague among my people. I've got to, listen, I heard a sermon years ago from an old preacher with this title. How to get God's attention before he gets yours. Now, how many of you would rather go that route? Yeah. And so the the scripture urges God's people to be faithful to him. Look at this this fifth biblical consequence of continued willful sin. Excommunication and expulsion. Remember the wicked man at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 4 says, when you're assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present. Hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. A man in the city of Corinth, again, had engaged in some very wretched sexual immorality. He was having an affair with his stepmother. And Paul writes to the church and says, you guys guys are going to have to deal with this man. He's he's committing this sin. He's, He's... Right there in the midst of the church, he's continuing in this willful sinning, and Paul says, you're not going to be able to put this up with that any longer. You're going to have to put this man out of the church. Hopefully, he will realize when he gets put out of the church, hopefully, he will realize that it's a bad deal to get put out of the church and away from the blessing of God. And, And Paul says, hopefully, he will realize that Jesus is a lot better Lord than Satan. Are you here? Look at a sixth biblical consequence of continued willful sin. This is from 2 Peter. Peter says it's possible that a person who wanders away from God having known God to go back to a life of sin that they can be worse than they were in the first place. And Here it is in 2 Peter 2. They themselves are slaves of depravity, 
For a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better, get this, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud. Peter says it would be better never to have been saved than to be saved and go back to the wicked world. That's hard for us to to grapple with. But that's what Peter says. It'd be better if you'd never been saved. Why is that? If you've never been saved, then your heart's probably going to be more tender before the Lord. If you've been saved and you know the grace of God and despite all of the grace and love of God, in your, despite all of that, you're able to turn your back on God and go running out and living in that, that wicked life in the world again, then your heart has become so hard that it'd be, it's gonna be harder to get you back than it was to get you in in the first place. That is frightening. Huh? That's frightening. That's right there in the scripture, isn't it? Now, it's not impossible to come back, but it's hard. Worse than they were. And the last warning, the last biblical consequence of continued willful sin is the, is the worst news of all. Hell may be on the horizon. Listen to this warning from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 10, 26 says, if we deliver, everybody say we, we, we. This is the writer of Hebrews, writing to people who have known the Lord. He's writing to believers here. He said, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. As we've said before, this is the case of deliberate, willful, defiant, continuing in sin for someone who has known the Lord. And the book of Hebrews says, there's, for someone like that, there's just nothing out there in the future. If they continue in that way, other than the raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. You know, one of the most precious descriptions in the Bible is given about Abraham. Abraham was called the friend of God. How many consider yourself a friend of God? Yeah, oh, what a precious designation that is but Hebrews 10 says if you deliberately keep on sinning and keep on going that direction then ultimately you will suffer the fate of the enemies of God so we see through the scriptures that willful continued sin brings nothing but devastation and disaster is everybody seeing it in the scriptures with me this morning say amen So when God says you've got to turn from your wicked ways if you've wandered off into that, the word of God as a whole supports that. So we review those wicked ways. We recognize the results of those wicked ways. Finally, we hear the command from scripture to repent from those wicked ways. And here's what we'll say. We've got to hurry. When we talk about repentance from sin, listen, recognition of sin isn't enough. It's not enough. How many of you know that you, uh, you have sinned somewhere in life? Ha- how many of you know that everybody has sinned, okay? Sometimes people excuse their sin by saying, well, everybody's a sinner. I'm a sinner just like everybody else. They use that as an excuse. That may, that may comfort you for a few days in this earthly life, but that will not be a comfort to you in eternity, So recognition of sin isn't enough. Listen to these five examples from the Old Testament. Exodus 9, 27, then Pharaoh 
summoned Moses and Aaron and said, this time I have sinned. But did Pharaoh repent? No. He said, I have sinned, but he didn't turn away from those sins. Before long, he would chase them out into the desert. He would chase them into the Red Sea. And what would happen to Pharaoh? He would be drowned in the Red Sea as a judgment from God. He said, I have sinned. It's not enough to say I have sinned. Are you here? Look at the second example in Numbers 22. Balaam, who was a false prophet, who himself promoted sexual immorality and promoted other sins as well involving idolatry. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. But did Balaam turn from his sins? No. He continued in sin until he was destroyed by the Israelites. And he in the New Testament, Balaam becomes an example of those who suffer the judgment of God. But he said, I have sinned. Look at the third example. We've already talked about Achan out there with the the junk buried under his tent. Achan said, it is true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. But he was destroyed for his sin. Look at the fourth example, 1 Samuel 15, verse 24. King Saul said to the prophet Samuel, I have sinned. But did Saul repent of his sins? No. He continued on in his pride and arrogance and sin. And he was destroyed on Mount Gilboa because of his life of sin and arrogance against the Lord. When when King Saul was chosen by God, he was small in his own eyes, but he became large in his own eyes. He became arrogant and proud against God. And God destroyed him. He said, I have sinned, but he didn't repent. And then we see it in Matthew chapter 27, the crowning example of them all. I have sinned, Judas said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. But did Judas repent before God? No. Judas betrayed the son of God. And John chapter 17 would say that Judas went to the place that had been prepared for him. Acts chapter one repeats that. Judas went to the place of punishment. prepared. He said, I have sinned, but he did not turn his heart toward God. Look at me, everybody. Look at me, everybody. Look at me. When God says, turn from your wicked ways, he's not, he's not saying, just, just say you've sinned and, and you know, everybody sins and use that as, as an excuse. No, recognition of sin isn't enough. Is that loud and clear this morning? No, recognition of sin isn't enough. Repentance is essential. Ezekiel 14, therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says, Repent. Turn from your idols and renounce all your detestable practices. You've got to turn away from that willful sin and turn back to the Lord in obedience. And when you do that, your return to God is embraced. Nehemiah chapter one says this. Here's Nehemiah praying. Remember the instruction, Lord, you gave to your servant Moses, saying... If you are unfaithful, get this, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and what? And obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring to them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. God says, if you wander to the farthest nation, if you will turn back to me, says the Lord, and determine to obey me, says the Lord, I can bring you back from the furthest horizon and bring you all the way back home into my presence. Now, isn't that a good God? That's a gracious God. That is a holy God, but that is a gracious God. 
who says, turn back to me with your heart. Come back into compliance with my will and my commands and you will find a place at home again, a place of healing and forgiveness and restoration. Your return will be embraced. Like the prodigal son coming home, the father will open his arms wide to receive you. Now, are you listening to me this morning? I know that many of you in the house today don't really need this message. But there are people in your circle of influence who do need this message. And we need to be aware of what the word of God, we need to be aware of what the word of God says about the power of sin. And we need to be aware of what the, power, the word of God says about the power of God's grace and salvation. Amen. So return will be embraced, says the Lord. If you'll come back to me, and ultimately, if you'll return to me, God says, restoration will be employed. God will say, here, here's, here it is in my words. God will say, welcome home. Now let's get to work. Are you here? Because you know, when people get out there in the pig pen, they get mighty dirty sometimes, don't they? Don't they? When they get out there in the pig pen, they get really messed up sometimes, don't they? And when they come home, they really need a, they need a real work from God, don't they? But God says, welcome home. Now let's get to work. I'm ready to forgive. I'm ready to heal. I'm ready to restore. restore. Here it is in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. To the prodigal son, we hear this. Luke 15, 22, but the father said to his servants, as the, as the son came home from the pig pen, the father says to the servants, quick, Bring the best robe and put it on him. Oh, I love that, don't you? (laughs) Think about this. He's been the worst boy, but bring the best robe. Isn't that just like God? He's been a bad boy, but he's my boy, and he's come home. So bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now let me give you a practical word, 830 service. When somebody who's been out in the fields of sin, wreaking havoc and messing their lives up and going their own way, when they come home to the family of God, let's rebuke the spirit of cynicism. Are you here? Let's quit saying, well, they've been here, they've been here before, easy come, easy go. Let's, let's, Let's refuse to do, and, and let's welcome, maybe if the body of Christ would welcome the prodigal home with more of a celebration, maybe that prodigal would recognize, man, I have missed this place and it's good to be home. Because you know what, when we, when we come home from a distant country, we're coming home not only to the father, but to the family, yes. So right now, here's what I want us to do as we close this series of messages. Maybe I've taken a little bit bit of a different approach on this promise than others would. But here's how I want us to close this morning. I want us to take time at the conclusion of this service. It's already 9.52. We're not gonna take long, but I want us to come into agreement right now. I want us to come into agreement for every person that we know who once walked with God, but has now wandered away from God. 
and needs to come home. I want us to speak their names just, just between you and the Lord. I don't mean out loud, but I want us to speak their names to God today. I want us to come into agreement that the lifeline of God would be thrown out into that distant country and that the Holy Spirit would be working over time. The Holy Spirit already does that. I want us to pray that God will bring the backsliders home.